were the last time. We were talking about functions, and we were just getting into the idea of scoping. We had just cracked the nice, crispy surface of the creme brulee. So, scoping. Just to quickly recap, in general, with scoping, there are two scopes that you have to be concerned with in most situations. The local scope, which exists solely within the function itself, and the global scope, which exists for the entire program. Um, yeah. So here, let's, let's dive right into our example here. So, this is a program that doesn't have any functions at all. As a consequence of that, all of the variables defined in this file are global. Yes, thank you. So n, it, so the scope of a variable is its domain of applicability. In general, variables are not applicable before they are first declared. Right. In other languages, you would have an explicit declaration statement in place of uh, n equals 7, for example. Uh, in C, you would say integer n equals 7, uh, semicolon. That integer denotes the first instance. Uh, it, it, it types the variable as being an integer uh, so that it's unambiguous and we know how big it is and, uh, because C lacks many of the dynamic mechanisms uh, that Python uses to be able to, you know, sort of be able to turn n from an integer into a float and then back again and then maybe make it a string later on. Um, C is a lot more, like, rigid in that. And I know I compare things to C quite a lot, but C is representative of a lot of uh, other programming languages like this. At any rate, if you try to use a variable before it's first been assigned to, that is an error. It will tell you this variable that you're trying to access doesn't exist, and that's a problem. Of course, we should be used to the idea by now that the instructions in a program are executed in the sequence that they are existing in the file. So n equals 7 goes first, then x equals 1, etc., etc., etc. So the scope of n is the entire file. The scope of x is the entire file except for the first line, where is, which is before its declaration. Any questions so far? Should be uh, pretty, you know, so far so boring, right? Awesome. So, all of the code here is at the top level of the program. Once this code is run, we, can, we can't call it again with different inputs, so one of the problems with writing your code like this is that you're essentially, um, well, this isn't quite true, but it works and cuts against the idea of modularity. So basically, doing it, uh, not using any functions, does give you a certain degree of modularity, but that modularity exists at the level of the file not within the program itself, and it's often useful to have modularity within the program itself. So, no reuse of any of these statements. We can't use them more than once because we haven't put them in functions. All variables in this context are global variables. Oh, um, is there too much? How's the picture? Is there too much light in the room? We're good? Okay. So, if, on the other hand, we have a function, say factorial, in which we have n defined, then x, the, um, the domain to which n and x apply is specifically just, that pro uh, just this function. Right? These are now local variables because they're inside of a function. Am I, am I hitting this point too hard? You guys, like, you guys all good with this idea? Yeah, okay. 
So, yeah, in that case, I'm going to skip forward a few slides. Um, so, because they are not defined outside of the function, if you try to print them or access them in any way outside of their domain of applicability, you'll actually end up with an error. You'll get the same type of error as if you used a, uh, used a variable name before, like a global variable, before it's been defined. Right? It's just not defined in that context. Make sense? So, now this is, this is where we're starting to get a little bit uh, into some new stuff. Um, so, I, I think I might just do this as, a, uh, as an example. So let's say we had some simple function, right? Define um, func. It uh, let's say it takes n. We'll call it func. Funky func. It will do print. Won't. You take me to uh, while let's uh, uh, num log gets me every time i is equal to zero while i is less than m print monkey town. Then we call funky town, funky funk. With say three. Execute this. Python three. Uh public five. Ah. I made an error. I, didn't I tell you you'd see me do that in this class? I forgot to increment i. There we go. There we go. So we got three funky towns. So let's introduce a global variable to this. So let's say we want not just to test to see if i is less than n, but n plus some global variable, let's call it blob. So, you would need to define the global variable somewhere inside of the global namespace, right? That's, that's what these are called, incidentally, as namespaces. Here, let me move that over and down something off the edge. So, blob is equal to 3, for example. Let's see what happens here. We get six funky towns. So, the difference, uh, let me, let, so let's, let's do one more thing here. Let's make it so that the global variable is incremented every time this function is run, right? So, that way, if we have repeated calls to the function, we should get more funky towns each time, right? So, let's, at the end of this function, say blob plus equals one. Let's see if this works. He says, no, it won't. Unbound local error, local variable blob referenced before assignment. So, what the heck is going on here? Essentially, functions have read permission on global variables, 
but they don't have right to permission unless you explicitly give them that permission. Giving them permission is quite simple. All you have to do is at the top of the function say global blob and this will fix the problem. You can see that each time it might, like, I could have made this more obvious, I guess, but uh, each time we run this, we get 6 the first time, we get 7 the second time, and we get 8 the third time. The global variable is incrementing. But in order to use the global variable, you have to give that function read and write permissions. Now, here's another interesting thing, right? So let's say we... Um, Let's, let's modify this somewhat and say we want to control the number of exclamation points. We'll make that, uh, we'll, we'll do that instead, right? So all I've done here, rather than uh, saying funky town more times, blob now controls how many exclamation points will go at the end of it, right? So let's see, let's just check to make sure that works. This perhaps is a little more visually obvious what's going on, right? So let's say, just for, just for the in, uh, sake of uh, argument, let's say we didn't include this, but we defined blob inside of this function to be one, right? What happens? It's one each time. So this is an example of what um, namespace conflict arbitration, except that is the fancy way of saying it. But essentially, global variables which have the, uh, sorry, let me start over. Local variables which have the same name as a global variable will take precedent. Uh, precedence over the global variable. So, although the global variable with the same name still exists in this context, because I have not defined that to be a global variable in the function, I've just defined a local variable in the function with the same name, it uses the, uh, it uses the version that's local instead of the version that's global. Uh, including, uh, and that's for both reading and writing, right? So the fact that blob is being incremented at the bottom here doesn't matter because that's the last statement in the function, and as soon as the function is over with, blob is deallocated and recreated on the next function call anyway. So it always starts off with a value of 1, like even if it wasn't uh, initialized up there, but it would have to be like anyway. Like, it no longer exists after this point, right? Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes? Is it going to do a later function afterwards and reference the blog again? That will still, the global variable will still not be available. Uh, could you repeat the question, please? If you're going to do another function after 113, the global blog variable, oh. and you would have a few local blogs, it would go to the rest of the local blog? Yeah, so, um, if I'm understanding your, correct, your, your question correctly, say we had a second function. We had a, another local variable with the same name defined? Yeah. yeah, that would be scoped just to that function in the same way that this one is scoped to that function. They won't communicate between functions. Yeah, actually, the correct way to think about a function is as a miniaturized version of the file itself. So all of the rules for the file will apply, uh, are applicable within the function itself, up to and including defining subfunctions. So you can actually, and this this is kind of getting off topic a little bit, but um, let's say uh, we wanted to encapsulate this bit here uh, inside of its own function, right? But it doesn't make sense to have a function that does that that's defined globally. You can actually also define local functions. So, def um, exclaim um, 
give it some value. Actually, you can still use n because it'll be bound to this function. But um, sort of the same rules will apply, right? But let's call it x just for the sake of not confusing people too much. Return exclamation point times x. We can then use it here. Right? I'll just demonstrate that that works. Right? Um, and you know what? I'm going to re enable this as a global variable. Just for the sake of interest. Because I liked it better that way. Make more sense. There we go. So that works. That's a fu sub function which has been defined within the function. Uh, normally, the terminology that's used is helper function. But, as with locally defined variables, if you try to access a locally defined function outside of its context, you're going to get the same gosh darn thing. Did I spell it correctly? It would be terrible if I showed you something and it was because I had spelled it. No, I spelled it correctly. Okay. It's like, this didn't work because it doesn't exist. It's like, well, you just misspelled it. It's like, oh. Anyway, so exclaim does not exist outside of the function uh, context, of, context of the function because the function itself is local to that context. Uh, make sense? Yeah, no trouble. Any other questions? Uh, yes? Can you pull that to Oh, yeah. Yeah, so on line 9, how come you use the semicolon? Oh, uh, because I'm here. <laughs> because um, force of habit. And apparently that's valid syntax. So, but in Python, it's not necessary. Every single gosh darn programming language other than Python needs semicolons, as long as it's not a functional language. Um, any other questions? Yes? Can a function call another function if that function is inside the function? It's not inside. It's not inside. Um, so, like, for example, if I had, like, um, like another function here, func2, the company. Um, yeah, so if I try to like print, you know, um, exclaim seven just for the sake of interest, and then I, you know, call this one instead of doing that, which doesn't work as we've demonstrated. Yeah. So, what's interesting in Python is that it actually gives you a trace of which function your error can occur in, right? So, it's like, in this file, in this function, on this line, this doesn't exist. So, yeah, uh, no. Uh, the functions don't communicate each other's functions to each other. Question? I'm sorry, can you speak up a bit? Uh, can function call function? Uh, yes. Yeah, they're both this, they're both in the uh, in the same global namespace. So um, yeah, let's try it. Yeah. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Uh, because they're both in the global namespace, they both have access to each other at that level, right? Question. Well, when you reference, or when you give permission to write over a local variable, does that actually change the variable? Like, and, uh, yeah. So, log would be incremented by one, even in the global essence. Yeah, and you can see that happening, right? Blob starts off with a value of three. The next time that uh, funky funk is called, it now has a value of four. The next time, it now has a value of five, now it has a value of six. The increment is being held between the function calls. That's the whole point of a global variable. 
Um, question. Excellent question. Um, it has to be defined before the function call, not the function definition. Um, basically, it has to be declared before it's used. Um, but as we know, with function definitions, um, where's my cursor? There we are. This is not actually the function executing. This is just the function being defined, right? Hopefully everybody has like a good grasp of that concept by now, um, because it's fundamental. But yeah, so for example, if I were to move glob's definition down here, I would get glob not defined. Excellent questions. Any other questions while we're on the subject of questions? Yes, sir. Uh, where does the nonce come from? I'm just trying to understand the nonce. Uh, the non? Oh, yeah. non. Oh, here. Oh, that's, yeah, that's a good one. Um, uh, oh, yeah. Um, it's because you're printing funky funk. Yeah. So, funky funk, right, because it's got no return statement defined, will return none by default. Right? So, so yeah, I've, I've kind of made a mistake here. I'm printing the return value of funky func called, by, called with 7 here. That return value is none, so none gets printed. Right, just because the function the, the functioning itself, the function itself has no input required, like it has like, no arguments. Well, it doesn't have anything to do with there being no input here. It has to be, it has to do with this function, not defining what its output should be. Right. So well, it yeah. doesn't have a return statement. Yeah. yeah, it doesn't have a return statement. Right. So for example, if I were to put one in and return uh, return for example done with the func. That's what gets returned. Now when we are calling funky func here, here, and here, we're actually throwing away the return value because we're not putting that inside of a print statement. But if we wanted to see it, we could easily see it. And done with the fuck. Make sense? Right, so the print statement itself either has to uh, do with the return statement or, or else it will return none by default. Yeah. In some way that well, uh, attach that idea to the function and not not the print operation itself. The print operation is just, it's just working with what it's got, right? The none type is what's passed by default when a function doesn't have any return, uh, anything to, like, any return statement to come. Right, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? I feel like we've been learning today. This is good. So, um, oh, no, I don't want, no, no, stop. Um, good. So that's basically all of this stuff covered. Uh, actually, much more than it. Um, so, so global variables. Then we, um, to some degree, all of this talk that we've been having about global variables is hopefully something that you won't really use in this class. Um, it's not necessary for the assignments, except maybe in one or two very specific instances, which we're going to see an example of when we talk about recursion, uh, perhaps later today, perhaps next week. But like global variables themselves are not necessarily what we consider good design. And uh, there are some reasons for that. So. One of the golden rules of software design is the so-called principle of least privilege. The idea of the principle of least privilege is that you only give things as much access as they need to perform their task and no more than that. So for like a good example of this, um, you know all of you Windows users, when you're trying to install a program, 
And like you get that pop-up that says, oh, this thing, this program is trying to install itself. It's like, yes, because I asked it to. Um, what that dialog box is actually doing is it's using a temporary invocation of administrator privileges for your system for the process of installing software, which can only be done with administrator privileges. You can actually set yourself into, like, I am always administrator mode, but I wouldn't recommend that because if, you're, if your uh, account ever gets compromised or invaded or hacked or anything like that, then you've automatically given the hacker uh, administrative privileges over your system, which is like the hacker's, like, it's, it's like the hacker was just walking along the street and found like a great big jar of Skittles just in the middle of the street. That's what it's like. Um, so the principle of least privilege is that nothing should have, like things should be constrained to as small a scope as possible, right? Um, it turns out that this also has added benefits, not just for security, but the, um, say, manageability of programs, right? So none of you will be to this point yet, although I imagine most of you feel like you've been to this point probably so far in this course. But when you're working on large programs, like, say, 10 to 100,000 lines of code, right? Simply managing the complexity of that system is it's a sufficiently rigorous intellectual task that very few people want to do it. Testify? Absolutely. Yeah. Painfully. Painful. It's painful when the when the thing gets too big, right? And, and you know, it's like, I don't know what this variable does because I wrote this six months ago and it's used here, here, and here, but I didn't leave a comment to say what it does, and it's like Multiply that by about 10,000, and that's what a large program looks like. So, essentially, the more you focus on using local variables rather than global variables, the more things are constrained to a particular context, and the more modular your code is. Um, I, I, I explained to you guys about what spaghetti code is, right? We had to talk about go-tos a little bit. Well, very quickly, um, go-tos allow you to loop all kinds of threads of edge execution through a program so that it looks like a great big tangled ball of string. Um, global variables contribute to that fact, uh, they contribute to that same problem in a different way, right? Um, every time you use a global variable, what you are actually doing is you're putting constraints on the use of that function, right? So, because the function, any function that uses a global variable will do something different depending on how many times it's been called. Sometimes you want that, often you don't, right? Uh, the design principle for functions is that you should always, always, always try to get the same output for the same input, right? So essentially, like, you can't think of any global variable into a function as being an additional sort of implicit input into the function and an implicit output out of the function. And, you know, you, you kind of want to, like, keep that as tight as possible. It, it really helps. Like, you want to think about software as if it were Lego, you know? Um, but, yeah. Any questions about that? We're going to talk about a few, like, sort of general design oriented. Oh, question. Oh, I was wondering, uh, just to make sure, in a function declaration, are all variables double by default? Um, like, you mean all of these guys? Like n and i and rest of the double by default. Yeah, um, yes, all are default by, by, by uh, sorry, all of them are local by default, yeah. Good. Um, any other questions? Um, good. You know, it has been, it has like always been my dream that I could never achieve to have like a marshmallow gun in my briefcase and just pop the 
people who are sleeping. I've always wanted to do that. But it's probably against the regulations or something. I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so, so let's talk about some additional design principles for software engineering. And I know I talk about software engineering a lot, and this is a computer science class, but like, it's good to, like, you should take from other disciplines what is useful to you, right? So these concepts of modularity and decomposition and the sort of more rigorous approach to software development allows software engineers to construct larger programs than they would be able to if they didn't have these principles. And like, each one of these principles has been hard won. Um, I don't know if it's still the case, but um, a number of years ago there was a statistic that came out that um, half of all software projects attempted by companies fail. And it's because of problems like this. You can write a program that becomes so completely unmanageable that the whole project just needs to be scrapped. And then, you know, the hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that your company has been pouring into, like this improved HR system, for example, McMaster, and in fact, that was more like tens of millions of dollars, actually. Um, $60 million within the first year and a half of its existence, actually. I'm talking about Mosaic. It's a piece of trash, anyway. Yep. It is the worst, like, you could have, you, they could have hired people for, from, like, it would have not cost that much to do the whole thing from scratch, and it would have been better. Like, it doesn't even make any sense. But, anyway. Um... So, anyway, so it's totally possible for a software project to fail. In fact, they fail all the time. In fact, the uh, system that you guys are all using to, uh, you know, conduct very important thousands and thousands of dollars of transactions is, in fact, a failed software project. Um, so, anyway, and that's because it was, like, hacked together over one summer by summer students. Like, actually, though. No. Um, like, they didn't actually hire anybody professional to do it. They just got it. Anyway, <laughs> I digress. So, the principles that keep you, uh, keep you in your job, keep your company getting contracts for software, and, uh, you know, keep your sanity in check, which perhaps is the most important of those things, modularity and decomposition. You should think of software like a Lego set. Each brick should be pretty small, and it's, what's important is the way that those bricks have been put together, right? Um, yeah. So each piece of software needs to be reasonably self-contained. It should be constrained so that its inputs and its outputs are obvious. It should have a clear purpose, right? Like it needs to solve a problem, right? And it needs to be reusable. So, like a lot of the problem that you see with, um, like, and you guys, I imagine most of you are in this phase right now. Like, decomposing a problem into sub problems is a skill, right? If you have that skill, you will do well in this class. All you have to do is, work. all you need to do is learn how to do that to software, right? Like. Decompose it into small bite-sized problems, solve the small bite-sized problems, and then put it all back together, and you'll have your solution, right? Basically, if you can do that at the level of individual programming statements, that's how you program, right? Like, each individual statement in a program can be thought of as an operation which has inputs and outputs, right? But obviously, that's too fine a grain, right? That's that's too fine a grain. We need something a little more coarse. So, at any rate, so one of the things that um, enables the uh, the code reuse and the clear purpose and all of that is the mechanisms of abstraction 
which are being used. So, what is abstraction? Anybody have anybody have like a decent like definition of abstraction that they could share with the class? What does the word mean? Anybody? Anybody at all? It's a difficult word to define, actually. So you know. Yeah. Something that doesn't necessarily represent what it is. Um. Yeah. Uh, so, so if I were to propose like a thing which is not abstract and a thing which is abstract, right? A thing that is not abstract would be something like, say, an orange, right? Something that is abstract is like a picture of an orange, right? It conveys the essential details about the object without being the object. That is what a function interface does, right? It conveys the information necessary to the use of the function without needing to get into the details of how the function works, right? This is what we should be shooting for. Um, yeah. Now, there is a danger in abstraction, right? Uh, the danger in abstraction as represented by abstract art. Uh, this is the portion of the class where I rag on abstract art a little bit. So, during the early part, the late part of the uh, 18, uh, late part of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century, there was a movement in art to work from realistic painting into more and more abstract forms of painting. Um, you know. You had things like pointillism, you had things like cubism. As, ab as the art became more abstract, right, it moved further and further away from a represented, representative representation of the thing which it is supposed to be, right? So by the time it hits cubism, it's like, I'm not even sure what this is supposed to be anymore. And then by the time you hit the 1950s, it's like, I'm really sure that this is just color on a canvas, right? Like, there's a danger in abstraction of it getting too far away from the thing it's abstracting that it's no longer understandable as that thing, right? So, we, like, there is a danger of having too much. And in our context, that would be declaring a bunch of functions without providing useful names for them. Right? It's like, sure, you are modularizing, and it is a function, right? But because you haven't provided a sufficient description of what you're actually doing here, um, you know, we can't, we can't, we can't know all of the like important details that we need to know about this thing, so we can't use it effectively, right? So that's a long way of talk, saying documentation, documentation, documentation. Any questions about that? Yes? Is this kind of related to like, the idea of um, the dot where it was, what was it? The dot typing? Oh, a dot typing. Yeah. yeah. Is it similar to that? It is similar to that, yeah. Um, so, actually, this, this hits upon my one of my primary criticisms of Python as a uh, programming language. So, Python as a programming language uses a system called the duck typing, right? Uh, so if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So that's what that actually means is the manner in which you, you use something in Python constrains that to a set of things that fit its usage, right? Um, my essential contention is that that eliminates too much useful type information and makes the program actually more difficult to use, not less. Um, because it sort of allows you to include, like, it allows you to program while thinking too loosely about the program, essentially. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a pedantic point because most people seem to manage with Python anyways, you know, despite the fact that the typing system is terrible. But, um, you know, 
I feel that when they made that move, which was to abstract away the entire type system for Python while still trying to have a type system, that they, they had that problem, that they left, they departed too greatly from the actual essence of what it, you know, what it actually means. Because like, type systems are important. It's actually very difficult to program if you don't know what a type system is in a language that expects you to know what the type system is. Um, like Haskell, for instance, heavily, heavily loads um, most of the errors that you'll find in a Haskell program are actually type errors. Um, that like type systems are a whole branch of research, the whole purpose of which is to exclude bad programs and bad programming practices from being possible in programs. Um, so if you don't have a rigorously enforced type system, eh, anyway, um, yeah. So, uh, just as an example, for example, so Twitter. You can think of Twitter as being a large program attached to an even larger database, right? Um, the thing I like to say about Twitter is um, Twitter isn't scary. Twitter is just a database. It's the people on Twitter that are scary. Um, so if you imagine Twitter as just being this great big database full of tweets, timestamped, right? Um, you can think of various, the various functions that Twitter has as being individual, unified, small, little functions. So sending a tweet is you record some text to the database, you know, along with associated metadata that allows it to be found. You know, storing in the database one operation. When you send a tweet, all it does is send the tweet. Right? Um, liking a tweet, all that does is it looks for the database entry, finds the number of likes counter, pops it up by one, that's all it does, right? Uh, deleting from the database, but deleting from the database, same idea, right? In fact, viewing a tweet from the database, same idea as well. Um, like all of these functions are small self-contained. Everything that's a button is a function. Right? Make sense? Any questions? Good. So, so Python has a particular manner in which it likes it likes its uh, its functions to be documented. You may not have known this, but Python actually has a help function. If you put a function into the help function and call it. What it does is it looks up that function's documentation string, its doc string. Um, so let me show you first the syntax for that. So it's three, three. Three quotes, three quotes. Every, everything inside of that is the documentation for the function. So takes a, an integer n and bumps out to it, returns the end of func. There we go. So this is, this is a piece of documentation which I have written for the function now. If we call help, not left, help, on funky bump, we get an indentation error that expects this to be indented. There we go. It actually pops you into this different mode entirely. And you can see help on function funky funk in module main takes an integer n and funks out to it, returns the end of func. So it gives you back the doc string that you have encoded for. This is a way of interfacing with Python's own inbuilt documentation feature. You can have, uh, I think I've shown this before, but you can, um, you can actually look up help on all kinds of functions, like the built-in functions. 
like, for example, print. This is all of the information that you need to know about print. Right? Actually, that's probably more information than you need because we haven't really talked about what SPD app is uh, to any extent or degree. Uh, if you want to, um, if you want to know about that, you should take one XC three while I'm teaching it. I don't know. We'll see. I'm a sessional, so I don't like I, I find out only probably at most three weeks before the course starts whether or not I'm teaching it. I'm gonna try though. Yeah. Fingers crossed for me too. I really like that course. That's actually one XC three is my favorite course. Like I love that course. Don't say. Yeah. I didn't get it this semester, so so I should go cry about it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I should cry about it. You should. Yeah, you're taking it right now. <laughs> That's okay. Um. So anyway. So there are a few things that I, it's very important that you put in the documentation. Because this is Python, one of the most important things for you to put in the documentation is what you expect the inputs to be in terms of type. Is n an integer? Is n a float? Is it a string? Is it a list? Is it a tuple? Who the heck knows? Unless you put it in the documentation or put a type of annotation in it, um, which isn't binding, but it can help. Um, unless you put that in the documentation, who's going to know? You have to put it in there somewhere, right? Um, or at least you should. It's considered good practice. So that's one. You should explain what the inputs are. Number two, you need to explain what the output is, right? You should also say what the type of the output is. Like if this thing outputs a dictionary, it should be noted that it outputs a dictionary. If it outputs a tuple, you should say that. Um, basically, the only way to know that otherwise is to run it on test inputs and see what it does, which is not ideal, you know, because it, it should be documented. So it's often like, so for the output, though, it's not sufficient just to say what type it is. It should also be said how this relates to the input, right? It's like, presumably, the function does something to the input to get the output. You should give a summary of what it does, right? Fortunately, um, that's actually sufficient. So if you know, like, if you know about a function, what, like, what the output, what the relationship of the output is to the input, that's actually all you need to know. You don't need to know a lot of the internal details of the function. You don't need to know that you assign the variable x the value of 3 on line 27. That's not necessary information, right? That's the stuff that we're trying to safely leave out, right? Make sense? Good. Um, so, for example, the make change problem from the last class. This is the this is the documentation. This is good documentation for that function, right? Assumes target is an integer, and that coins is a sequence of integers in decreasing order. In decreasing order, very very important. If that's not true, that algorithm doesn't work. If that's not said in the documentation, how are you? How the heck are you supposed to know that's that's supposed to be the case, right? Because there's nothing about the about the name coins which implies that it should be in descending order, right? Returns a dictionary with a key for each entry in coins and a corresponding integer for the number of coins of that denomination. That describes what the output is in terms of the inputs. Any questions? All right, have a good weekend.